uh, Lenara Connect right after your keynote right here. Uh, so what are we talking about? Uh, well, so today I was speaking about what the next 10 years of infrastructure and the internet would will look like, uh, in our opinion. Because uh, you, you, you're doing a cloud company uh, in an era where uh, Amazon is giant and Google is giant. Which one is bigger, Amazon or Google? They're pretty big doing um, cloud? Well, I mean, in terms of their cloud platform, Amazon is definitely the bigger. The two, yeah. So Amazon is not just selling uh, stuff. They're like they have this huge thing on the internet with the cloud. Yeah. But they're. How, how does your cloud dif differentiate from theirs? Yeah. So Amazon Web Services, um, is has a has a product called uh, EC2, which is Elastic Compute. Um, and what that is is essentially a virtual public cloud. Um, so what you get from them is uh, a virtual machine in the end is really what it is. Uh, and um, what our cloud is, is a bare metal cloud. So it's dedicated servers, uh, looks and feels to the end user, very similar to Amazon Web Services, um, where you request a server over an API, you get it in a few minutes, it's billed by the hour, um, but it's a fully dedicated uh, server. So no hypervisor, no virtualization, uh, no virtual machines. Um, totally dedicated bare metal server. Um, now, a lot of people will bring their own hypervisor or load their own uh, virtualization software on that, the, the dedicated servers, um, but we don't do that by default. So people could, uh, could buy some bare metal servers at your place and then uh, provide a service like Amazon Web Services if yeah, they want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we do have some, uh, some sort of niche uh, cloud providers that, yeah, exactly, get dedicated hardware from us. They put their own virtualization software on there and then essentially resell it. And, uh, and uh, you uh, may be one of the uh, initial innovators in uh, providing ARM servers as yeah. a bare metal uh, a service. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially in the data center, um, you know, ARM has its roots in the embedded space, obviously. Um, so generally in phones or other embedded devices, the Raspberry Pi is a very well-known one uh, that runs using uh, ARM chips. Um, and so, yeah, we're the first um, cloud to provide an ARM server that's basically an enterprise-grade, data center-grade uh, ARM chip uh, alongside our, our Intel chips. And uh, if this works out, if the, all the software is there, if all the work that NAR is doing, it's, if it works out, everything, yeah. it could really explode, right? It could get really big yeah, very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the... You know, um, once the once the software uh, is you know solid and people have confidence that it's just going to work out of the box on the ARM architecture, um, you're going to see people that um, are, are just going to be too attracted to the price and the performance and the features of these different ARM boards and chips that are coming out right now. You know, Qualcomm, Cavium, um, both have an enterprise grade, data center grade um, board and chip. Um, and the economics there and the price to performance just completely blows Intel out of the water. Um, and so really, in my opinion, it's just a matter of the software adoption. And so, uh, so uh, you the founder of Packet or oh, co-founder? I'm one of the co-founders. Co right. So there's three, so, three of us. Three involved. of you. So uh, how, how did you sit down and get the idea? Uh, that was not so long ago, right? Uh, that's right, yeah. So we started the company in 2014, um, and uh, I was running a managed hosting company, um, and I was actually a customer of Zach, who is our CEO at Packet, um, and he had sold his previous company, um, but we had done a lot of business together and got to know each other quite well, and so um, after he had sold that company, um, yeah, he approached me in, you know, I think late 2013 or early 2014 and said, look, you know, I think I see that there's an opportunity in the market here um, for either people who are sort of in a traditional either co-location or dedicated server environment um, or uh, at scale in a public uh, virtual cloud like Amazon um, that aren't being serviced well. So if you're in the traditional rack and stack or co-location environment, um, you're not really able to take advantage of the elasticity and the flexibility and the scalability of the cloud. Um, but you're, you're kind of stuck there because on the cloud side, um, especially at scale, um, while you have a lot more flexibility and you have uh, a lot more of that scalability and on-demand um, programmability, um, it's very expensive. Um, and, it, and it generally suffers from performance inconsistencies, generally poor network, um, and various other problems. And so 
Uh, but if you're in the cloud over there, you can't generally give up all of those nice things about the cloud to move to a dedicated server environment uh, just for the economics. So we felt like if you could automate that hardware and get the price and economics and performance closer to a traditional dedicated hosting environment, but with all of the elasticity and programmability and ease of use of the, of the virtual public clouds, that you'd really kind of like hit that sweet spot. And so that's what we've done and that's kind of was our bet there. So what's the, the, cloud, uh, what's the hosting company you were working at before? Um, well, it was a small boutique company that was um, part of a web development agency uh, that I was the owner of and that worked primarily with governments and nonprofits. Um, and the company that Zach sold was a company called Voxel.net that was a dedicated and virtual uh, hosting company that Internet bought in 2010, I believe. And uh, uh, so, so there's there's a lot of work to be done in the future, or you already achieved a lot? I mean, you have... a uh, you have SoftBank and Dell. Why are they so happy to work with you? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, Do you have so, something special going on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, there is not a um, there is not a cloud like us that exists. Um, and not and, and uh, so, uh, especially if you look at the integrations that we have. So, you know, we're integrated with um, all of the kind of popular infrastructure orchestration software out there. So there's Terraform, Ansible, Docker. Um, LibCloud, you know, we have uh, a bunch of different API clients and all the kind of popular, you know, programming languages out there. Um, and so to be able to get bare metal servers at the end of an API like that using that software is not something you can get anywhere else. Um, and so it was actually a really nice fit uh, as we were closing our funding round with SoftBank. Um, right around that same time, they acquired ARM. Um, and we had already been talking internally about bringing an ARM server to market uh, because we're very bullish on it. Um, and so uh, that was actually a great fit and it ended up, um, you know, we ended up bringing that Cavium Thunder X uh, chip to market in October of last year. Um, that's been received very well. Uh, and um, now actually work in collaboration with ARM uh, on uh, the Works on ARM project, uh, which you can see at worksonarm.com. Uh, and the goal of that project is to foster software adoption uh, for ARM and, multi and, and to kind of bring multi-architecture support to a lot of the foundational software that's out there in the world running most of the internet um, in the hopes that, you know, once the software gets there, uh, the adoption of ARM in general uh, uh, for internet-based um, software is going to take off. So you have 50,000 deploys right now every month. That's pretty pretty high activity, right? So who are, the, who are those kind of customers that are deploying on your? Sure. What kind of people really need what you have? Yeah, they you know they range from Fortune uh, 500s to um, SaaS platforms um, to gaming companies. Um, some IoT companies. Uh, a lot of people are using us for their uh, CI/CD pipeline. Um, we have a bunch of um, uh, basically uh, continuous integration platforms and image building platforms and testing platforms that use our hardware for their build systems. Um, so it's a wide variety of things. You know, we have ever, uh, people that are using everything from. VMware and Zen KVM virtualization to, you know, orchestrating containers with Kubernetes um, to running containers directly on the bare metal. Um, so it's a it's a pretty good mix. Um, yeah. And they wouldn't be able to do all that stuff on a traditional virtualized kind of hosting ser service. Well, some of those things absolutely not wouldn't work. Um, you'd be essentially running a hypervisor within a hypervisor, <laughs> um, and there are certain workloads that you can't that won't. There are certain software that won't run inside of a, hi uh, a hypervisor at all that need direct access to the hardware. Um, and for the workloads that you could run in a virtual environment, like you can certainly run containers and orchestrate them uh, into a virtual public cloud like Amazon or Google or Azure without any problems, you're just paying a little bit of a hypervisor tax because you're running that container within a VM which is running inside of a hypervisor on the bare metal, whereas with us, you can run the container directly on the hardware. 
Uh, could you mention a little bit what you were doing in the in the past in the political campaigns? I'm um, sure. Yeah, uh, it was like tech, tech. You were part of tech teams, right? Yeah, that's right. So I was a I was a web developer for um, Howard Dean's presidential campaign in 2003, 2004. Like making uh, PHP kind of stuff yeah, on, the, on the web. Yeah, that's like that. exactly right. Yep. Yeah. So um, I was part of the state web development team, and so I was building everything from, you know. Um, Ride board, ride sharing, volunteer uh, coordination software to you know door knocking software to um, content aggregation. So you did ride sharing um, in 2004, like well seven, six years before Uber. Uh, yeah, not exactly the same thing. Okay. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, uh, helping people hitch rides with each other to events and that sort of thing. Um, because and then, there's a lot of tech infrastructure under these uh, huge uh, things that are very. Uh, famous like those fa presidential campaigns, they yeah. have some tech going on that's, yeah. that's quite complex, or yeah. needs to have bare metal service servers or what? <laughs> yeah, they yeah. do. Um, uh, yeah, the, there are definitely um, there is a whole ecosystem of software and platforms that is totally just focused on organizing events and campaigns. Absolutely, and it ranges from, you know, very small, out of the box. I'm running for school board and want to pay ten dollars a year for it, all the way up to yeah, the hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent on the big presidentials. And when people are customer in your system, is it easy for them to load balance and and manage uh, huge traffic peaks? They just buy more automatically and just uh, make sure it works and stuff. Or yeah, absolutely. Spread I mean, around in different data centers and. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we don't have a hosted load balancer service, but um, if you're uh, tooled up in a microservices framework and are using Kubernetes already, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you can you can request more services on demand. Um, we are a global platform, so we have, I think, 15 locations now. Um, so we definitely have people that are doing, you know, multiple sort of region but facility deployments for various reasons, either just straight up load balancing or DR. Um, How long does it take to lo to to deploy an extra uh, extra capacity? Yeah, you I mean, have like a you might get out of stock if yep, people that, need a lot suddenly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we definitely have our limits, uh, so that does happen sometimes. But you know, part of we spend a lot of time doing the capacity planning and capacity management to try and keep out ahead of that. Um, we have a spot market, um, which is. Uh, basically um, lets you get servers on an open priced market um, and then but al allows us to basically claw them back at any time um, so those are for workloads that obviously are okay with all of a sudden a server disappearing um, but we have very that allows us to basically have a, what uh, what would otherwise be unused capacity, um, but sell it essentially below market. And then if we have demand somewhere else that's basically at our list rates, we can claw that the claw those resources back and allocate them to paying customers. So that there's some levers that we have in the platform to kind of help uh, with that capacity. And do you have unlimited bandwidth. You have really good fast well, internet. Well, there's no such thing as unlimited bandwidth, but I mean, yeah, we're uh, we run our own fiber backbone, um, and so you get you know you 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 pay for the bandwidth that you use, um, but yeah, you we don't we don't late rate limit it at all. Um, so most of the most of the higher end servers that we have have dual 10 gigabit NICs in them, so you get a 20 gig line rate network port, um, and you're free to saturate that as much as you want. And bandwidth <laughs> is not so expensive. Um, it's. Uh, I wouldn't say we're on the low. Lower, lower. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say. The more you use, the cheaper it gets. Yeah, I'll put it that way. And I wouldn't say that we have the cheapest bandwidth in the world. You know, it's definitely like you know we pay for peering. You know, we're very aggressive uh, on on the network side. So you're paying for good bandwidth. Um, but we're also not the most expensive in the world either. All right. So looking forward to uh, what's going to happen in the future. Hopefully. The ARM server is going to rule the world, and yep. you're going to be uh, ruling that world too. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be the year of ARM in the data center. <laughs> cool.